Welcome to Behind the Lens, an ongoing conversation about all things film happening here in Eugene, Oregon. My name is Tom Blank, and my guest today is Mark Stafford. And with me, helping me interview Mark, is my friend Mike Duffield. Uh, Mike is an editor, and Mark is a videographer. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, um, as a videographer, how did you get started? Well, uh, it was uh, 1982. I just uh, got my degree from the Univers University of Oregon. I was working uh, three part-time jobs, uh, looking for work. I couldn't find anything. And uh, sure enough, I found a fourth part-time job, and that was working as a production assistant at what was uh, then called uh, uh, Westcom Productions, and they were making a, a series uh, called the uh, Bill Dillinger Track and Field uh, Series. And so I get to be a, a production assistant on a fairly high-end uh, project. Was it video or film? <clears throat> it was uh, shot and video. It was, uh, I got to toll around a one-inch portable uh, video recorder and um, I wasn't allowed to use, but uh, we had a $50,000 uh, Ikigami with a beautiful uh, uh, Plumicon tubes and a 30-pound tripod. and you know, five pound bricks, batteries. Sounds so. very heavy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Back then, uh, I remember one day we went out to shoot, uh, I think it was the high jump, and uh, we didn't have a field monitor. We just had a black and white viewfinder in the camera. And we had shot the whole day. We got back to uh, the post-production facility and looked at the footage, and uh, John Kramer, who was the producer uh, and the videographer on that project, uh, was just came unglued because everything would, had a blue tinge to it. It was all off white balance. In fact, I don't think he white balanced uh, at all. So uh, that whole day's worth of effort was like ruined. So that uh, created an a opportunity for a new videographer? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, John actually uh, was part of my little uh, biddy company, and uh, so uh, he mentored me. I got to work uh, with that. Um, one of the nice things that I liked about being out there was that I got to meet these amazing people, uh, including Bill Delinger. Uh, another series they had called uh, Outside the Arena, I got to meet uh, Russ Francis. Uh, who was a football star, and uh, he was a very likable person and encouraged me to, to continue. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did, and uh, we, we did a lot of small projects, and uh, you know, we shot tons and tons of things. I did uh, Jillian weddings and all kinds of uh, legal recordings and... One thing after another. Yeah. So, Mike, do you have any sympathy for uh, beginning <laughs> that way? Or, yeah. Well, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, is interesting about uh, the process was that back then it was uh, video in a, in a very um, economical sense uh, that, was, that was starting to change. And, and you want to talk about what that change was back then for you, mm -hmm. especially in the production end of it? Well, at that point in time, it was this, the very beginning of uh, VHS was coming out, mm -hmm. a consumer format. And so um, uh, Ampex had sold the VHS yep. uh, off to uh, uh, JBC because mm -hmm. yeah, they didn't think they could do anything <laughs> with it. And sure enough, uh, JBC licensed it to, oh, to anybody who would pay them a license fee. And so now they have this amazing distribution format. Uh, for home video. And, and that's VHS. Uh, VHS. And of course, Betamax was uh, Sony's uh, uh, proprietary format, but they wouldn't license it to anybody they, uh, until the very end. And that was, and that was too late. And that was too late. Yeah. But now you could watch a full length motion picture film mm -hmm. in your home instead of going to the movies. Wow, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. We, we're talking about seismic shifts in culture mm -hmm. and the arrival of the VHS cassette is the device that allowed that movie in your home uh, living room to take place uh, and you mentioned the Betamax um, do you know the story of how VHS survived and Betamax didn't? Well I thought that was just a licensing thing but from JVC. Well it, it has it has uh, 
it has some, maybe you know, Mike, that, mm. uh, that the, uh, it had to do with governmental support, ultimately, which consumers had more invested hmm. before a, uh, a, uh, a standard was accepted. I didn't know that. That's interesting. I know that uh, IBM had uh, adopted a beta, beta max format, but uh, back then they were using uh, beta one, hmm. and uh, Sony came up with the, the consumer speeds. They were using them for trade shows, uh, beta two and beta three, and they dropped the beta one format. Hmm. And uh, IBM was not a very happy customer. Right. Well, it, you know, what uh, my memory of that is, is that the, uh, it was a race to get the American consumer invested in VHS yeah. before they uh, spent money on uh, uh, beta disks and uh, uh, beta uh, decks. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, VHS won that particular battle. Yeah. I remember uh, buying my first set of blank VHS cassettes, and I think they were like ten dollars a piece. Yeah, I bought ten of them for a hundred bucks. But you could re-record over them. You could, and that yeah. was also amazing. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, that you know, that's that's in the past. Uh, you came in during that <coughs> seismic shift, and what was the next thing that happened that? Uh, impacted your career? I think the broadcast formats, um, Betacam was uh, being used, it was very expensive and uh, Sony finally uh, came up with a less expensive uh, U-Matic format and now for the first time documentaries and other industrial kinds of video production uh, was being produced uh, with an affordable format that uh, some folks could afford to buy and uh, so an editing system uh, that you would buy at a TV station would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. But my first editing system was about $6,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A considerable investment even then. It was uh, mm -hmm. certainly more than a new car yeah. uh, at that time. But it certainly it was just at the point where I could afford to do something like that. And then, of course, uh, Betacam which was a broadcast format, again, uh, those machines would cost, you know, as much as a house, $50,000. Uh, they came up with a, a less expensive version that uh, my first Betacam deck, I think, was $8,000. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, now here I am, f fully capable of going out and shooting broadcast video um, for, you know, something that I thought was affordable. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah. And what year did you create your own company? Uh, we incorporated in uh, 1982 mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't do hardly anything. We, I was ready to throw the towel in and say, you know, this is enough. I've got to go on with my whatever I'm going to be doing here. And sure enough, the telephone rang and it's a $10,000 job. I've been, oh. Got your attention. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, fine, I'll just I'll go ahead and try this. And sure enough, it, the business grew and grew and grew. And uh, so we moved over to uh, South Eugene. I've been there for, I think, uh, like 26 years now. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, you know, there you are. You're a videographer. You're making a variety of product. You're making um, documentaries. You're making commercials. What other kinds of things did you make? Yeah. So most of the, of the videos that we were producing were not for broadcast. Um, so they were for trade shows. Okay. Um, and uh, or some kind of uh, the invention of the all-in-one system where you have a TV set and a VHS mm -hmm. thing allowed people to take these tapes and take them to trade shows. And so now they could uh, demonstrate whatever they, were, they wanted to demonstrate right. um, their product. And so we were making instructional videos on, you know, how to put together a whatever, cardboard box, you know, or uh, we're making uh, uh, videos on uh, espresso, espresso machines. Um, I still get a commission check from Espresso 101, which <laughs> is a, a how-to video on uh, how to teach uh, baristas on how to make espresso. Well, <laughs> congratulations. <Yeah. laughs> uh, you know, I have another thought that I, I'm not sure that it fits in here, but let me just throw it out. Making documentaries using video 
in the early 80s, if those documentaries were to be exhibited, were they not then changed to film? Did you put them onto film? Yeah. And, well, you'd have to go back and, and think about um, when you say exhibited, if they were going to be exhibited on uh, television, no, you didn't mm -hmm. go there. But you're right, if they were going to go to a theater, there was a transfer process for putting it onto film. And it's interesting because it wasn't a very pretty process <laughs> 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 because the image quality was very different from video, going from video to film, especially back at that time. It wasn't frame by frame, it was real time. Yeah, but uh, you know, if we just look at the, uh, uh, the history of videography in the large form, mm -hmm. um, in the big, in the large scale, uh, it wasn't that much earlier that the only way of recording something was the kinescope. That's true. That's right. That's you know, true. and you know, when I was in college uh, in in live television courses, mm -hmm. uh, kinescope was the the reigning format. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't this opportunity <laughs> to uh, to record things even on a Betamax. Yeah. I think right up into through uh, school, we were receiving films uh, and 16 millimeter film all the time for distribution. Yeah. Yeah. And so we'd have an Ike projector, you know, or a whole closet full of them uh, that we would uh, watch whatever uh, we were supposed to watch that day. And not until I think my last year uh, in high school in the mid 70s did we have a three quarter inch deck yeah. where hmm. we're actually seeing films that were on tape. Yeah, then that now you could see them and they looked pretty good. Correct, right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, going from kinescope, which is a, a very um, bad image, to uh, uh, actual well-lit videos mm -hmm. is an enormous step. And people have forgotten it. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. For the sure. most part. I was talking with uh, Scott Douglas, who's a colleague of mine, and uh, he was uh, sharing with me the lack of lighting now that's taking place on a lot of projects mm -hmm. where uh, they will crank the uh, digital DSLR up yeah. and uh, they'll get the lighting that they want on the face and they'll let the whole background just go to wherever it's going, uh, which is almost unheard of huh? in, yeah. in yeah. our production, we're always concerned about uh, lighting to Getting the point where we use multiple points of light. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any questions for uh, what well, happened? Well, I was going to ask, you know, as, as a videographer, do yeah. you carry a bunch of equipment with you? Do you carry lighting equipment, things like that? Is mm -hmm. that still part of your uh, entourage or no? Yeah, so we have a lot of stuff. Uh, we do have a light kit, and it's a fairly... Uh, um, light kit <laughs> yeah um, so we are using uh, some uh, we're still using a little bit of tungsten uh, we're using uh, hmm. LCDs uh, we have uh, oh, I don't know probably uh, you know half a dozen uh, different main uh, lighting instruments and then a couple of other ones that we use for uh, creating some effects for the background uh, the tripods are now carbon fiber uh, the cameras are getting lighter I still have a beta cam that weighs about 25 pounds that I spent, uh, you know, I don't know, $25,000 on. And just for fun, I went on to eBay mm. uh, a couple months ago. And uh, sure enough, I can buy one for like $300 now. You know? Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. They're, they're boat anchors. Yeah. Uh, but the equipment's getting a lot lighter. You're seeing, I think, a, um, quite a bit more production values now because you're able to stick these lighter cameras on uh, mm -hmm. like some lightweight jibs. Mm -hmm. uh, we just bought a motion control for a slider that does uh, both animation and, you know, it goes back and forth. And and for special visual and effects. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, um, the thing that occurs to me about cameras getting lighter, lenses getting faster, is how we move this into the commercial uh, consumer market. And the, uh, the young people of today think nothing of buying a camera and going off and becoming videographers. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your experience of uh, what's possible? I think it is possible. I think that if you have a, a young person with a lot of ambition and uh, that knows their equipment, uh, that they can go out and do some great things. 
but we've also seen, uh, you know, some disasters happen uh, yeah. over the years. And uh, that's going to happen, I guess, in, no matter whether you're a videographer or whether you're at lighting or sound mm -hmm. or an, as an editor, uh, you get the software. You're just not 100% knowledgeable about the tools and how to use them. Yeah. And so, um, as I was sharing with you, uh, Charles Dowd, who was a professor at Duvo, and, and we did a music uh, uh, training video with him on uh, drums and bass guitar with Warner Brothers, uh, his mantra was practice, practice, and practice some more. And uh, you really need to develop your craft and get out there and work with as many people as you can, yes. get input from people who you admire, I think, and, uh, and just uh, go out there and Try your thing, and you're either going to fail uh, or you're going <laughs> to succeed. And or, or both, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. you'll fail first, and then if you persevere, you may succeed. Yeah. Uh, but I, I feel that uh, one of the important things for uh, the newer generation to yeah. understand is that art doesn't come automatically, but it comes after the mastery of craft. And craft only happens when you master your equipment. Yeah. So, um, yeah. what do you think, Mike? Well, I think that's a probably a pretty valid statement. Um, you know, anytime you're learning anything, uh, and especially in the visual arts, you always have to go back and look and see what's been done first, learn from it, and then you can pick up your tool, whatever it is, whether it's a camera or or a, you know, a sound recorder. A sound recorder. It could be. It could be even a non-linear non editing system, and then spend so many hours with it that no longer are you actually holding equipment, but you're using a brush mm -hmm. in essence, and then it becomes art. But it only becomes that once you've got all that other stuff behind you. So once like you have to pay your dues. Well, it is. It is paying dues, but it's also learning, and and the process doesn't stop. You know, I'm still learning. I will continue to learn. My learning hasn't stopped either, and it won't, as long as I'm going to stay active in the business, at least. You know, that's, that's the caveat there. Well, I think the business has made that necessary. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, that if we are going to continue functioning as professionals, we have to be aware and alert yes. to what the changes mm -hmm. are. I, uh, at one point, interviewed for a job, um, and the a uh, phone call that I made, I needed to be able to do editing. They wanted me to be able to do uh, compositing, which is a, its own unique field. It's an effects field. Uh, and they also wanted me to be a very good mixer, uh, which is its own field. And you know, they wanted me to be three people and to do one job and get paid for one job. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, maybe I shouldn't be interviewing here anymore, you know. <laughs> because the reality is uh, you can be good at one of those probably, uh, but you can't be good at all of them, mm -hmm. I don't think, from my experience. Uh, you can be mediocre in all of them. And I think that oftentimes happens. Sometimes we're working with a client, uh, for example. Uh, we were working with the Chinese uh, Sports Network, uh, shooting uh, some Chinese athletes at the Prefontaine Classic mm -hmm. last year. And we finished shooting that day. We headed over, we did the post-production, we produced these packages, and we sent them up on the satellite uh, to China. And we would get feedback in real time. Hmm. And I'm going, wow, this is just amazing. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we're actually capturing <laughs> the feeling that they want over there, we're just chopping this together as us Westerners would, would put it together. They're going to put on all of the titles and stuff like that over there. Um, we also, of course, uh, uploaded the raw footage to them uh, so that they could probably change it. But yeah, I, it's, it's a difficult thing to try to do everything. It's just it's it's, it's very really hard. close to impossible. It's yeah. a little arrogant, too. I think so. <laughs> when we're out there shooting, what I'm thinking about is how can I make this shot better? And how is this going to go together in post-production? Right, right. Uh, so that Mike can actually chop something together that makes sense. And, and to follow up, as an editor, when you're cutting a sequence, you'll start seeing things work, and then you have expectations. And when the shot is not there that you need next, then you have to recut. 
because your expectations are not being met and the story may not be told the best way. Yeah, the, be you know, the question of telling the story through the selection of significant detail is, is useful no matter what your craft is. Mm -hmm. That if you're a writer, you have to indicate what the story beats are. If you're the director, you have to identify those moments that tell the story. And if you're the editor, you have to string them together like a string of pearls. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's the job. That is the job. You, <laughs> I, as a DP, a director of photography, I, I like to get input from people. But it's my decision. I get to decide mm -hmm. how that shot's going to take place. And, and the location, the camera, the iris setting, the lighting, uh, how is the sound uh, going to be uh, taking place? So I, I get that responsibility, but I'm depending all the time on all these other people yeah. to do their craft. And that's why I, it's so important for when you're working with professionals, it's, it's so much easier. You're working at the top of your skill level and uh, with all the grace you can. But uh, when you start combining, you run into all kinds of problems with the inexperience. I think. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk, uh, Mark, a little bit about your experience doing special projects in your history mm -hmm. of videography. Tell us about your trip to the pyramids. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the producer decided that uh, we needed to uh, smuggle a camera into the Great Pyramid, <laughs> and uh, so what we had we had preparation. We we brought the camera gear with us. Uh, I knew how to use it. But what I didn't know was how much time we were going to have to put this piece together. So what we ended up doing was we practiced in our hotel room the night before we went in there. And we turned all the lights off. And we assembled everything and put it together. They didn't have GoPros back then. So we had a separate camera, power supply, and a recorder. You put them all together in the dark. We put them all together in the dark. And we had it down to a science. We knew what we were doing. So. The day uh, we got our permits to go into the pyramid, we went inside. There was a large gallery there in, in the Great Pyramid, and uh, it uh, actually has some lighting inside. And I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be really easy to do. And so uh, we had the camera already embedded in a hat. It was uh, like an Indiana Jones hat. And uh, I started hooking up all the wires, and I'm just about finished when I hear this voice behind me, and it says, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I turn around and I look, and sure enough, it's one of the tourism police. They're standing behind me. I'm, we've already ran into these guys before. They stopped us from shooting um, a couple of days earlier and uh, wanted us to go get a $3,000 permit. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I thought, <laughs> oh, no, we're in big trouble now. Well, it just so happens that we were standing uh, in front of the Queen's Chamber. And I looked at that, and I turned to him, and I said, you know, we're just kind of looking here at the Queen's Chamber, but it's all locked up. And he turned to me, and he said, oh, you want to go down there? And I went, well, I don't know. And he goes, I can make it possible. <laughs> I'm going, oh, he just wants a bribe. That's all. <laughs> and the producer turns to him, and he goes, nope, we don't want to go down there. We're going up to the, the top. Bye. And off we go. And so we were able to get the footage. It was pretty dark up there. but. It was a successful uh, endeavor. It was, and uh, you know, our blood pressure, I'm sure, was like uh, sky high because we thought, well, maybe we're going to prison or something. Well, you're you're talking about something that happens with uh, guerrilla filming all the time. Mm -hmm. You want to steal a sequence or steal a shot, mm -hmm. and in this case, you took an Indiana Jones hat and put the camera in the crown. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty innovative. That was a lot of fun. But, you know, how many times have we run into situations where we go to the environment and we think everything's going okay and then it turns into chaos? And uh, I, I can tell you another anecdotal real quick. Uh, we're shooting a coffee video up in Portland. And here's a guy with a cup of coffee. He's sharing it with his dog. And I'm shooting this guy sharing the coffee with the dog. And here comes this woman walking up and she's hotter than can be. And she looks at me and she goes, are you shooting me? And I said, no, I'm shooting this guy and his dog over here. And then she says, are you calling me a dog? <laughs> <laughs> and then she grabs a hold of my, my clothes and starts shaking me. 
And uh, I'm looking at the two producers, and I'm just going, get her off of me, please. <laughs> and uh, they, they took her off. We had a couple of people walk by and say, I saw the whole thing. She assaulted you. You know, I was just going, yeah, yeah, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, this is the nature of the film business or the videography business is you're out among the real people. And you cannot depend on the real people to behave the way you expect mm. them to. No. <laughs> so the, 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 the job of being a videographer or being a, a guerrilla camera team is uh, an adventure. And it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have stopped uh, trying to uh, guess at uh, when I go to a location. Uh, you always have these uh, assumptions, but uh, they oftentimes change. Uh, so when you design a storyboard and you go out on location and you're looking at this and going, oh, this isn't going to work, uh, the lighting's completely different. You've got to be able to adjust. You have to be able to adapt. And that seems to be the essence of this particular uh, profession, is uh, the readiness to adapt is one of the components of the professional's craft. And it's very true in post-production. I'm sure that you run into that all the time while you're sitting here trying to think of how am I going to fix this dilemma? Sure. You know, ad adapting a, a lot of times depends a lot on the, your budget. Uh, the bigger your budget, the less you have to adapt. Uh, smaller productions, I just finished a uh, low-budget independent uh, film and I did a lot of adapting because they weren't able to capture all the things they wanted to, even though they had storyboarded and they had thought that when they went on location, they could shoot it all. Well, they just couldn't do it. They didn't have time. They didn't have daylight, oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And so you do. You adapt. You learn because you spent so many hours uh, in, a, in an editing room or, or in the field. Uh, you spend so many hours doing things that you learn to automatically almost uh, change. And you know what the point you need to make is. Yeah. Therefore, your task is not just to shoot that which was storyboarded, right. but to tell the story. Right. And if you can get the story told, you've done your job. That's right. That's what it's all about. Well, I want to thank both you guys for this wonderful conversation, and I uh, hope to see you again. Um, Mike Duffield, editor uh, extraordinaire, and <laughs> Mark Stafford, videographer for the city of uh, Eugene. Thank you all very much. We'll see you later on Behind the Lens.